going to talk about uh, feeding therapy in the schools, the why and why nots. Um, this question always comes up, you know, so when I first started um, in this field, I was determined I was never going to work in a school setting. I was going to be a full-on medical SLP. All of my externships were in medical settings. Um, I absolutely loved feeding therapy. It was my favorite thing to do um, of all the therapies that we do. And I do love a lot about our, our field. Um, but then, uh, you know, I was an older student. I had um, changed my major. I transferred in. So when I first was looking for jobs into the field, I had two little kids already. Um, and the school setting just made more sense. Um, Time-wise, schedule, everything. Like it does for so many of us in our field. You know, the majority of speech therapists work in the school setting. Um, so one of my professors at the time said, you know what? We have a new school in my district that has three multiply disabled classes. Um, so New York is a little different than New Jersey. Um, I know in New York, you have District 75 where you have your more medically fragile students and they tend to be all in a medically um, disabled school or, or more self-contained setting. Um, in New Jersey, they have gotten away with that a lot. Um, only the really severe students go to what we call out-of-district schools where it is all for special needs. The rest of them are all in general education settings. Um, so they've all been brought back to the schools and they have what are called um, separate self-contained classrooms. So in my building, when I first started, there was a language learning disabled class. At the time, it was a behavior disordered class. Now that's changed to emotionally, um, emotional regulation disorders. Um, and then we had three multiply disabled classes. Um, and so she, when she told me about the school that had just opened up six months before, um, she said, you know, they have a lot of medical needs and a lot of um, disabled kids, I think you would really enjoy it. Um, and here I am 12 years later in the same school. So I guess she was right. Um, and I really was able to do what I love combined with the school therapy and do a little bit of both. Um, and the thing is at the time I thought this was rare and it's becoming more the norm now. So a lot of students are being brought back in, in district. Schools are trying to cut their budgets. Um, they're trying to be more inclusive. They're trying to do follow more of the least restrictive environment. So we're finding more and more medically fragile students in the school setting than we would have ever before. Um, so here, so feeding and swallowing, just a brief overview. So feeding disorders are also known as restrictive and avoidant food intake disorders. Um, so basically it's a refusal to eat certain types of food, textures, um, liquids for at least one month. So it has to occur for at least one month for it to be considered a disorder. Um, which can lead to a child not getting the adequate nutrition they need, and it has the potential to result in developmental delays, um, depending on the age that it's occurring, how long it's happening, and what foods they are avoiding or are not able to eat. Um, many children can have an aversion to certain textures, certain foods. Uh, we see this a lot with our um, students with autism, with Down syndrome, with uh, CP, um, certain avulsions with sensory disorders. Um, they can also have a dysphagia. So not to be confused with a feeding disorder, um, dysphagia is an actual more physical disorder. Um, so this is where we're looking at structural difficulties in the, um, in the, the stages of the swallow. So we're looking at difficulties within the oral stage of feeding, uh, the pharyngeal stage, the gastro stage, and the gastroesophageal. Um, and sometimes they can have a combination. So they might have reflux or they might have, you know, some kind of weakness or paralysis or disorder. And to them, they're now avoiding foods and certain textures because they know that it's gonna hurt them or it's gonna cause pain in their stomach or it's, it's gonna make them gag or those things. And then they become more complicated at that point. <clears throat> so here, I'm sorry. I apologize because my setting's not my usual. I'm looking to the other side and, and wondering where things are. So here, okay. So, and I don't know why it's not going to the next page. Here we go. Okay, so some numbers. Um, according to the ASHA school survey that was run um, just in 2020, only 10% of therapists in the schools reported that they provide dysphagia therapy. This number has not changed in 14 years. 
Um, so we're talking about there's more and more kids every day, literally, coming into the school setting that have these disorders and, and, and need this therapy. Um, but the number of therapists that report that they provide this therapy has not changed. We're talking about maybe 0.2%. Uh, percent. Um, looking back at Jerry Lojman, um, I know many of you have heard the name when you listen to anything on dysphagia. Um, she's spoken about um, dysphagia in the schools over 20 years ago. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why that was in there, but um, apparently I had a thought. <laughs> um, but she spoke about dysphagia in the schools about 20 years ago and said it was something that was coming. It was something that was going to be important. Um, and it wasn't really addressed at the time. Um, Asha realized that there was a, a need. So in 2005, about, they created this subcommittee. And they decided that they were going to make guidelines specifically for providing um, swallowing and feeding therapy in the schools. They saw that this was an area of need, an area that a lot of ASHA members were saying that they did not have training in, um, especially those that had graduated previously. They did not receive training in their um, undergraduate or graduate studies, and they needed more assistance. So there's an actual guideline, and I do have the um, link to that in the references. And it's very specific as to what is needed to be done in the school setting. Um, so typical statements that people have against doing feeding in the school, um, that's the OT's job. Uh, that's the nurse's responsibility. Um, if the kid needs feeding, they need to go to an out of district school. I can't service them here. I took a job in a school, so I wouldn't have to do things like that. Um, School-based SLPs don't have that training. They don't possess that. Dysphagia issues are medical, they're not school related, and there's too much liability on the speech therapist in that setting. Um, and I do agree with some of these statements, and you're, we're going to go a little bit into why those are valid statements and valid feelings, and why we can also quash those statements and, and, and work through them. So educational relevance. According to IDEA, um, educational relevance occurs when a disorder impacts their ability to access the curriculum and participate as they need to within the school setting. So if something is impacting them educationally, then we need to address it as per code. Um, so socializ socialization with peers is reduced or altered when they have a feeding disorder. Oftentimes they don't get to go to recess because they're eating for longer times or because of their feeding difficulties, they might be embarrassed. Um, or shy and they don't want to eat in front of certain people. So they tend to eat in the classroom, they eat in the nurse's room, they eat in a closet, I've heard. Um, so they're losing that socialization time during lunch and during recess where they normally would have it. And sometimes they're actually missing instructional time um, because they're getting feedings in the nurse's office or um, whether it's G-tube or whether they're um, being fed orally but it's taking time or they're being pulled out of the classroom for those meals. Um, and then of course they're losing um, educational time due to poor health. So their nutrition is impacted, it, they have decreased focus in the classroom, decreased attention, which will overall impact their attendance. So students are constantly being absent, constantly not able to attend. Um, and then of course safety is a large concern when a student is at risk for aspiration or choking. So the last thing you wanna know, wanna hear is that um, this student is at a severe choking risk and they're sitting in your classroom right now as you're working with them on speech. Um, and if you're not doing something about it, who is? So you need to look at always, is it impacting their education and how? So some of the why nots. Um, principle of ethics two, rule A clearly states that individuals should engage only in those aspects of the profession that are within their scope of competence, considering their level of education, training, and experience. So if a therapist does not have the training and skills that they need, they should not be providing this therapy. Um, and that's just facts. If you don't know how to work with a certain type of disorder, um, you know, say you've never worked with augmentative alternative communication, um, and they wanna put you in a classroom where everybody is on a device or on um, a different augmentative setting um, system, if you haven't received that training, you shouldn't be working with those students. It's the same rule. Um, and even more so because feeding is so involved, you need to have the training and skills um, that are needed. If the therapist is uncomfortable 
doing this training. Um, so I've had that a lot in my district where they're like, well, you know, I'll have a supervisor or director say, you know, it falls under their scope of practice under speech. So they should provide it in the school. I don't understand why they're telling me no, and it's not acceptable. Um, and I've had to advocate for my coworkers and say, you know what, they don't have that training. They've never done feeding therapy and they don't feel comfortable with that. I would never put them in that situation um, and tell them that they have to do feeding therapy. Um, caseloads are already overwhelming. As we know, they keep getting larger and larger in the schools. Feeding therapy tends to take a lot of time. Um, even if the actual feeding session does not, there is a lot that is involved with feeding therapy that will require more of your time and more dedication. Um, so it needs to be worked into the caseload and you need to make sure that you have that adequate time provided for you. Um, you also have to realize that feeding therapy is usually done during students' breakfast, lunch, or their snack time. So if you're used to having, so for example, I usually have my prep in the morning um, when I first go in. I like scheduling my prep that way so that, you know, I start at 8.20. So from 8.20 to 9 o'clock, that is my prep. And I get my day ready. I get my, my materials ready. I make all my copies. I do what I need to do. I talk to all my teachers. This year, I can't do that because I have a student that I do feeding therapy for for breakfast. Um, so at 8.20, as soon as I come in, I put down my bag and I'm up in the classroom. Um, doing breakfast with them in the class since they're having breakfast in the class right now with COVID. Um, so you have to be flexible. And again, I have another student that I see during lunch. So that lunch block, her lunch block, I should say, is blocked out um, every day of the week. And I know that I cannot, um, you know, schedule my own lunch or schedule meetings or do anything else during those times. Um, and when it's not educationally relevant. So if it is a medical you know, a medically based issue that is not impacting their education, then we should not be providing that type of therapy in the school. I'm going to stop for a moment and see if anybody has any questions so far. Um, unfortunately, the way that I have it set up, I do not see the chat. So I just want to make sure. Any questions? So um, feeding should be a team approach. Um, this is another difficulty that happens. You know, a lot of people are like, um, it is just the OT that should be doing this, or it is just the speech therapist that should be doing this. No, it is a team of everybody that should be involved. So the SLP, parent or guardian, OT is uh, usually involved, especially if there are sensory issues. Um, PT is involved when I need seating manipulations. Um, different types of adjustments and settings. So, you know, for example, right now, one of my students that I have feeding for um, has severe cerebral palsy, is constantly flexed and pulled. Um, and, you know, when he's sitting in the chair like this, I can't feed him. Um, it's not appropriate. So I reach out to my PT a lot to help me work on adjustments and seating. Um, the nurse, of course, should be involved, especially if there are medications included. Um, if there are any medical concerns that we need to look at, the teacher scheduling, they need to know what signs to look for if the student does have aspiration issues. Um, they need to be involved in the scheduling. Um, the dietitian, of course, uh, if your school has a dietitian or if the student has a private dietitian that they work with. Um, my school does not, but I know that some schools do, which I think is a blessing if you do work with them. Um, I mean, I have my, my dietitian in the cafeteria. Um, who does work with me when it comes to providing me with certain um, textures and certain things. Um, not always flexible, though. It depends on where you are and what happens. So she will provide me with anything that is pre-made that way, um, but will not blend anything. So I have my own blender and I have my own thicket and I have my own things in my office that I will uh, manipulate textures as I need to. Um, but she will provide me anything else. So she'll provide me with the lunches that I can blend. She'll provide me with applesauces and, and yogurts and things like that. But, you know, otherwise I'd have to do that. Different schools have different approaches though. I know some that they say, you know, tell me what the kid needs and I'll have it ready for breakfast and lunch for you. And they take care of it. So involve them, see what they're willing to do, how much they can help you out. Um, and then of course, paraprofessionals, personal assistants, depending what state you're in, they're called different things. Um, whoever is working with that student, because a lot of times you're not there every day. You can't um, always be involved. And let's be honest, if you're feeding them every day, it's no longer therapy. You're just feeding them. Um, so the paraprofessional, the personal assistant is the one that does feeding and you train them 
and they can do their, their daily feeding. Um, and when you're doing the actual therapy, that's when you have it scheduled into your schedule. Um, and that's when you actually log it. And those actually count as sessions and have to follow the IEP. Um, so feeding, you should not be going in the room and doing feeding for this child every day, unless that is what the IEP says that they are getting fed, you know, X number of days. Um, and that's another thing that we forget to, if it's becoming at that point where it's a daily basis, it should be the power professional. And if they can't handle it, then maybe it's, this is not the right setting for that child. And you have to look at that, um, and be aware. Okay, so the role of the SLP. Um, when the SLP is involved in feeding, we create the feeding plans. Um, you have to write appropriate and measurable IEP goals that are educationally relevant. Um, you have to provide the therapy. You need to um, be the one who does the education and training of teachers and support staff. You have to document progress. Um, communicate with the parent guardian and where needed, the medical team, which is usually the doctor, um, nurse's office, everybody else involved, and coordination with the school nutrition services, which I just spoke about. So how to decide? How do you make that decision? Um, is it educationally relevant? Is it something that is impacting the student from accessing the curriculum the right way? from accessing their social um, emotional development within the school, is there some impact that is educationally relevant? Number one. Um, number two, and equally as important, do you have adequate training? Are you ready to do this therapy? And are you willing to do this therapy? Um, and I say ready and willing because there's two very different things. Some people are you know, ready and they want to, um, but they're, you know, they just need a little bit more training and some are just not willing. And it, that is okay. And we need to learn that it is all right to say, I'm not comfortable doing this type of therapy. I don't have the training. And I don't think even if I did have the training, I would be comfortable doing that. And that is okay. Um, is there a team ready to work with this child? So a lot of times um, I'm the feeding specialist for my school. So for my district. Um, so whenever there is a feeding issue in any of the schools within the district for any age level, um, from pre-K to high school, I go out to the school, I help write the feeding plans, I work with them and, and, and establish their team. Some schools have a team. My, my school, I definitely have a team that I work with. Um, the OTs and PTs work with me really well. Um, my child study team works well with me. The teachers, everybody knows that this is what I do and they're willing to help out. Some schools do not have that. The school nurse wants nothing to do with it. Um, the nutritionist doesn't want anything to do with it, will not supply anything. Um, the parent maybe is not willing to work with it. Um, you know, sometimes you need to look at it that way. And sometimes parents are more willing to take them to a hospital like St. Joe's or something that has a feeding program that is specific. Um, but we need to look at, you know, is it worth pulling the student out of school and having them in that program, whether it's full day, part day, weekly, whatever it is, and they're missing all that education or is it something that I can take care of in the school setting? Um, and do you have all the materials and supplies that you need? Um, so this is something really important that you need to look at as well. Um, do you have the cups, the gloves, the, um, the, the, the Z-Vibe and D-Vibes and things that we use? Do you have all of the maroon spoons that you might need? Or, um, you know, the, the seating like I was talking about. Um, we need to look at that and we need to address and, and make sure that we can get all that we need in the school setting. Um, and one thing that I, you know, I want to bring in also, so a lot of these students, when they come to the schools, um, so for example, I have a student that has Down syndrome who I've been working with, um, for years now. She's in eighth grade and about to exit the feeding program. She's doing really well. When she came to me, she was in third grade. Um, she had a lot of sensory aversion. She has a history of gastroesophageal reflux, really bad. Um, she did have oral and pharyngeal weakness. Um, she was basically avert to everything, did not want to eat anything. Um, she was on PD shore when she came to me and would not drink anything else or eat anything else. Um, she was underweight um, and mom was really struggling. She didn't know what to do. She said, I've been going through this for years. 
I don't know what to do. And they brought her to my school with her Pedialyte. And mom said, I'm looking for, you know, something that I can bring her to maybe after school once in a while. She didn't know it was out there. So I got her in touch with St. Joe's program. Um, they're a hospital that they do have feeding specialists, not speech therapists. They are feeding specialists that are trained just in feeding. Um, and it's a one month program for this. Well, it, it changes for each child. For, for this student, it was one month. Mom has to be dedicated to go to this program for one month every day, all day. So imagine that. Now this student is being pulled out of school for a month. Um, and it was only a month because I was willing to take her on after that. Um, but it would have been longer. She, mom has to sit with her there. She gets breakfast, lunch, and snack at the setting and then sits and basically hangs out in the waiting room for the rest of the day. Um, they play, they do other things, but that that is their day for a month. Um, but the program did work and it helped. Um, it got her to start eating um, pureed foods and to start drinking liquids from a bottle. Now I have this student and I wanna transition her to school. So working on my decision, how did I decide? I, um, I said, okay, I wanna observe what you're doing at St. Joe's there so I can transition it into my school. I got permission from my supervisor to take a day and sit with her in the, one day in the program and see what was going on there. Um, they were doing a one-to-one -one reward. So every time she took one bite or one sip, she was getting rewarded with a minute of watching on the tablet or was getting uh, a minute to play with a toy. So you can imagine how long these feedings are taking um, just to have like, you know, a little container of applesauce um, or, you know, if, you know, pureed, uh, you know, jello or pudding or something like that. She was taking a good 45 minutes to an hour. And that was just one meal. And she needed to be fed all of her meals. Um, they had her seated in a car seat. So they said that was the best because it was upright seating. She was strapped in, couldn't get up. Um, so again, not really adequate for the school setting. We're talking third grade at this point. Um, we're also talking about, um, you know, behaviors. If she decides she doesn't want to eat at that time, they will shift the time for her. Um, so I'm looking at, okay, how do I bring her into the school setting? Um, so I started with, a, I did bring a car seat, um, was able to have one and I had to feed her outside of the cafeteria. So she was fed in my office in the beginning. Um, we were, had to work on timing in the reward system. So we didn't do one on re one rewards for a minute. I gave her maybe a sticker on a chart every time she did it or a high five. We started transitioning it to something more educationally appropriate for the school setting. Um, I then worked on speeding up her time and cutting it down. Um, after a while, I was able to order. And th again, this is when you have a good relationship with your school and they are willing to get you the supplies, like I said, needed. Um, I was able to get a feeding chair of tomato, um, which was more appropriate for her to sit in. And it still was upright and it still had the seatbelt straps, but more appropriate for a school setting than sitting her in a high chair or in a car seat. Um, and then I was able to transition her into the cafeteria with her peers and she would eat there. I would feed her there. I was able to then train her professional that was with her to do her feeding. She had a massive tongue thrust as well. I should add in there. Um, that was basically causing a lot of spillage. She wasn't getting any food really down. Um, we got her to the point where I was able to do all of the sensory portion of it that I needed in my office during her individual session. And then we would transfer it into her feeding session. Um, and basically at this point now, like I said, she feeds herself. She eats, she drinks from a regular open cup. Um, she eats everything. Um, it's actually to the point where mom laughed, where she said, you know, when I brought her to you, she was underweight and now I need her to go on a diet. Um, because you know, she, she loves everything, but she still is unfortunately stuck at the stage of puree, um, with maybe some mixed chop in there. Um, but she does not like texture still. She, I think ever since she was little has such an aversion and knows that it hurts her stomach. She won't go to that. Um, so just working, you have to look at what, what the parent wants. Um, they are Polish. Mom's, mom loves cooking. She is a chef, actually. She loves cooking all the time. Um, and she said, my dream is for her to eat a pierogi one day, um, which for those who don't know, it's a potato-filled, um, like, knish, sort of. Um, 
And she said, I just really want her to hold one and take a bite of it. Um, so we did. I got her to that point where she took a bite of it. She chewed it. She manipulated it. She was able to get it down. She didn't like it, but she did it. Um, and mom was crying. You know, it got to the point where so many years of us pushing for this. But again, do you have that time? Do you have that dedication? Do you want to do this? So you need to look at how long is this student staying on with you? Um, and I don't want you to think that all students in the school are going to be like this. Um, I've also had my um, students with autism where I just work on food aversions um, and just getting them used to different textures. I've also had my pre-K students that just developmentally were a little behind, especially my preemies um, that come into the school setting that just need, you know, to get caught up with their age level peers. Um, and they usually only need, you know, a semester or a year um, of, of some therapy and they're good to go. So there really is a, a spectrum of everything that you can do within this field. Um, and with that being said, um, looking at, again, medical, nutritional, ethical, legal, um, you have to look at your, your own independent competency and the competency of those around you. Are they ready and willing and able to do it? You have to look at cultural um, issues and are you ready and willing to take on those cultural aspects? Um, and I'll bring up an example. So I had one of my therapists um, called me from another school and said, you know, she absolutely refuses to eat with me. She eats at home. Mom said that she feeds her, um, you know, jello all the time and she eats it and it's her favorite. And I go to feed her at school and she won't eat it. And it's a nonverbal child. Um, so I said, what kind of jello are you feeding her? And she said, jello brand, you know, I, I feed her jello brand. And I said, she can't eat that. Um, she's Muslim. So there's pork in that. And the girl knew, but because she was nonverbal, could not tell her that she couldn't eat it. I said, have mom bring in the one that she feeds her at home and see if she'll eat that. And sure enough, the next day mom sent it in. She ate the whole thing, devoured it, loved it. Um, and sometimes the kid does not have that cognitive ability to let you know. You need to be competent enough in your cultural sense to know what foods a student can and cannot have? What am I feeding them that is appropriate culturally? Um, are they vegetarian? Are they vegan? Are they are you, you know are there restrictions within their cultures? Are there certain foods that they only eat on high holidays or they only eat at home with their family? Are there certain ways that they eat? Um, some students eating with their hand is absolutely appropriate for them in their culture, and if they're just coming in and newer to the school setting, you have to be willing to let them eat with their hands. Um, so those are some of the aspects you need to look at. And, as, and again, as I said, you need to make sure you have support on every level um, or you will not be successful in, your, in this therapy. Um, and then these are the references that I told you about and that are in here.